Welcome to this conference uh, session. Uh, this is the session on collaborating with disability NGOs and supporting opportunities to collaborate with disability NGOs. Um, I'm Eleni Theodoru and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I am a 29 year old uh, white disabled woman with a visual impairment, uh, black hair, brown uh, glasses, and uh, blue shirt and black sweater. Um, I have been working with different international organizations uh, like the UN and NGOs uh, in the past, as well as multinational companies, and especially in the disability sector. And right now I'm working in the venture philanthropy and impact investing uh, ecosystem. Today with us, we have uh, some amazing speakers. Uh, we have Craig uh, Spence from uh, the Chief Brand and Communications uh, Officer from the International Paralympic Committee, Freddie Farhat, uh, Business Development Manager from Parafootball, and Donald Murphy, Operations uh, Project Manager from the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody and let's start with Craig Spence and his presentation on We The 15 campaign and this amazing movement that has been uh, created the past months. Apologies, everyone. Tech issue at my side. Uh, my name's Craig Spence, Chief Brand and Communications Officer for the IPC. I'm a 42-year-old uh, white male, um, described looking like Humpty Dumpty at the moment because I've got no hair and I have an egg for a head. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about We The 15, a campaign we launched on the 19th of August, just ahead of the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. Where we came from with We The 15 was the fact that the Paralympic Games is now the world's third biggest sporting event behind the Olympic Games and the FIFA World Cup. And we wanted to use the platform of the fact that we have a cumulative TV audience of 4.25 billion people watching our games to use that platform to really not just advance the rights of all the athletes who take part in the Paralympic Games, but how could we really advance change for 1.2 billion persons with disabilities who make up 15% of the global community. So if we go on to the next slide, I can just talk you through um, our, our thoughts behind We The 15. So what we wanted to do was create a new movement, a movement that would unite the world's 1.2 billion persons with disabilities behind a movement for change. Now, We The 15 is a movement that campaigns for change. And if you think about the, the world and how progressive it's been in recent years, there's been lots of progress in, in gender, uh, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, but disability is forgotten about, despite the fact that it intersects all of those three areas. So what we wanted to do with We The 15 was put disability right at the heart of the inclusion agenda by coming up with a campaign that governments, businesses, uh, cities, anyone around the world can contribute towards. Now, change doesn't happen overnight. So we said this was going to be a 10-year project um, that really would try to bring the world together as one and unite people. In the same way that the Pride movement has a rainbow flag, we created a symbol and for those of you with a vision impairment, it's best described as a purple circle uh, with a white inside. And it's a bit like a trivial pursuit square. And um, the, the clock hands are pointing at 7.35. Um, and that represents the 15% in the world with a disability. So we wanted purple to become the international color of disability and get this symbol out in the same way that the pride flag represents the uh, LGBTQ plus community. So this wasn't going to be an IPC campaign. So if we move it on to the next slide, what we created was the biggest coalition ever of organizations to advance disability rights. And it was described at a conference I spoke at last week by, by someone as uh, very, very significant in the uh, disability community as probably the biggest campaign for the last 30 years in terms of advancing disability rights. So we've brought together for the first time in history uh, the four sport organizations who lead on disability sport. So IPC, Special Olympics, Invictus Games and Deaf Olympics working together for the first time. From an advocacy point of view and a public policy, we, we, we spearheaded this campaign with the International Disability Alliance. For those of you who don't know IDA, they bring together 1,100 members from around the world uh, to advance disability rights and set policy with the UN. 
from a business point of view, we partnered with the Valuable 500. Now, for those of you who don't know the Valuable 500, it's an organization launched two years ago at the World Economic Forum to bring 500 of the world's biggest businesses to put disability at the heart of the boardroom agenda. We also looked at advocacy. So we teamed up with Global Citizen. We looked at how we could really make this uh, work with the UN agencies. So we brought in UNESCO, the UN Alliance of um, of organizations of civilizations we and it's a human rights campaign so we turned teamed up with the uh team at the office uh, the office of the high commissioner for human rights un human rights and then fundamental to change we knew was going to be assistive technology so we brought in um, many organizations regarding assistive technology so in total 19 international organizations working together for the first time to advance the lives of 1.2 billion people now, we decided to launch this campaign on the 19th of August, five days before the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Paralympic Games, because we knew that the world would start to be focusing on disability rights. And working with one of our, in, with our fantastic advertising agency, Adam and Eve, who are based in the UK, who work for us on a pro bono basis, we created a 90-second TV commercial where we, re, we wanted to provoke conversations globally regarding disability. Now, in creating this advert, we said, look, where do we stand in the world of disability? In one lens, it's pity. People perceive persons with disability through a pity lens. And at the opposite end of the spectrum is pedestal. You're a superhuman. You're so inspirational. And actually, the world's 1.2 billion persons want the middle ground. They want to be treated just like any other human being on this planet. But unfortunately, we're putting in place barriers that stop that. So we created a, a 90 second commercial in 10 languages. Um, today, we're going to play out a version for you. And there is an audio described version, which will be shared by the organizers as well. So if we can play out the TV commercial and you'll see what we created. So working with our broadcast partners around the world. So the Paralympics in Tokyo was broadcast in 180 countries. And we worked with 70 of our broadcasters who provided free airtime for that TV commercial to be shown around the world. So you're talking NBC in, in USA, you're talking Channel 4 in the UK, multiple broadcasters giving us free airtime to show this commercial worth billions and billions of dollars. But this was our broadcast rights holders commitment to the We The 15 campaign. In addition to launching the TV advert, we, on the 19th of August, worked with three PR agencies around the world who, again, gave up their time to support the campaign to really push a media relations campaign out there, telling people of the biggest coalition ever of organizations working together. Um, and the media coverage was stunning. So this slide, for those of you with a vision impairment, just shows all the media coverage around the world. Some tremendous headlines, like on the BBC, calling it a game changer campaign for the world's 1.2 billion persons with disabilities. And if we go on to the next slide, again, more media coverage around the world, global spread. And we actually managed to uh, generate 3,000 news articles in 24 hours around the launch. Now, in addition to the media coverage, we wanted purple to be shown as the international color of disability. So how did we do that? Well, if we go on to the next slide, you will see that we illuminated 225 of the world's most prestigious and iconic locations purple on the evening of the 19th of August. So we started off in Brisbane in Australia. And if we go on to the next slide, you'll see we just some stunning locations in Tokyo, Geneva. We did Times Square. We did Piccadilly Circus in London. If we finish, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, we even uh, finished in Vegas, like all good parties should finish. We ended up in Vegas and we lit up Vegas, Vegas but 225 iconic lo locations. Each one created a story. So in the morning, we announced the biggest coalition ever advancing this campaign. We launched the film. In the evening, we lit up the locations, had media there generating even more coverage. If we go to the next slide, we use the opening and closing ceremonies of the Tokyo Paralympics as an opportunity to really engage people in the campaign. So the opening ceremony is viewed by 250 million people, the closing ceremony, 200 million people. So at a key moment in the ceremony, we drop the lights in the stadium when everyone's watching, we went purple, all the digiboards in the stadium used the hashtag and our president spoke about the campaign in his opening ceremony speech and then we played out the film to everyone watching. We did the same in the closing ceremony. The only difference in the closing ceremony, if we go to the next slide, 
is that we did a film of all the world leaders who were behind the campaign from all the international organizations. So we had the UN Deputy Secretary General, we had the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, we had the EU President, we even had Prince Harry talking about how this campaign was going to transform the lives of persons with disabilities over the next decade. So a hugely impactful film that really engaged even more people around the world. If we go on to the next slide. We then also had influencers. So we had Salma Blair, we had David Beckham, all tweeting and sharing about this campaign on social media, which was which helped spread the message around the launch. If we go on to the next slide. And then we also worked with our sponsors. So the collaboration didn't just stop at um, NGOs and other disability partners. We worked with Intel to create a drone show where we created the drones above Finland um, during the We The 15 symbol. In Japan, during the Paralympics, Coca-Cola changed their symbol to purple for the first time in history. And they did a whole activation across the whole of Japan. Um, BP, one of our sponsors, they changed their identity and did a whole social media campaign, as did many of our other partners who saw this as an opportunity to really activate and get behind something new and something fresh, but something that was importantly needed. And then if we go on to the next slide, these are some of the headline results. So within three weeks, three quarters of a billion people had seen the campaign film. The, the uh, media coverage reached 6.7 billion people around the world. That's 80% of the global population. And, and on Twitter, uh, hashtag we the 15 has had 2.4 billion impressions. So great media coverage. But what's really cool is the awareness also is out there. So using Nielsen, who's our data provider, they found that 41% of people who'd watched the Paralympic Games we're aware of the We The 15 campaign. So great, great success for us. And of those who didn't watch the Paralympics, it's 21%. So one in five people around the world are aware of the global campaign to advance disability rights. And if we go to the next slide, we, what we were really keen to do with the launch was really engage Generation Z. So with TikTok, we've had nearly a billion impressions of, of content that we put on TikTok working with a partnership with TikTok. So we developed a partnership with TikTok, um, Google, Facebook and Twitter to launch this campaign. And the results are pretty phenomenal in, in terms of engaging Generation Z. And then if we go on to the next slide, which is the final slide. So what next? I mean, this is a decade of action um, and we really, really want to, to make changes. So at the Global Disability Summit next February, we'll be announcing how anyone in the world can contribute to We The 15, whether you're a government, a business, a city or a human being anyone can contribute towards We The 15 to make a difference. We're going to be asking people to make, make purple pledges, commitments on what they're going to do to drive social inclusion for the world's 1.2 billion persons. And using the influence that we've got, we're going to make people accountable because no longer can disability be forgotten about. We have to be at the heart of the inclusion agenda alongside ethnicity, sexual orientation and gender. And now is the time for change and We The 15 aims to initiate all of that between now and 2030. So that's my presentation today. Eleni, back to you. Thank you, Greg. What an amazing uh, campaign. And I think when we all watched the video, um, the first reaction was smile and feeling of belonging. Um, I, I just want to go through some questions with you. Um, you collaborated with so many diverse stakeholders and actors and sectors to, to push this through. You had 80% uh, of the population uh, reached. So how easy was it to actually put together this multi-stakeholder, multi-sector partnership? I, what, I, what is the key? I dare say the pandemic helped uh, because the games were postponed by 12 months. So that gave us a bit of a greater timeline. But being able to communicate the vision for the campaign to all these partners, I felt like for, for 12 months that I was a salesman, basically ringing everyone around going, we want to do this, but we need you to make it work. Nobody said no. Everyone realized that with the pandemic, which has disproportionately impacted persons with disabilities, now was the right time to act. And the fact that we when we talk about leaving no one behind, we were leaving behind 1.2 billion people. So everyone was more than happy to get on board. And like I say, we've been to, we've gone to 70 broadcasters who gave us free airtime because they realized that they would, this could be a great purpose driven campaign for them. And that's really been fantastic. And now what we want to do is really amplify 
this campaign beyond the awareness we've got already. We want the whole world to engage in Reader 15 and, and with the partners we've got and we'll bring more on board, we're determined to do that. Perfect. And what, what would be the, the key message that everybody should remember from your presentation today? I think the key thing I want everyone to remember is that everyone can contribute towards the success of this campaign, whether it's by um, doing something in your own daily life that uh, helps persons with disabilities, or just by promoting the campaign film and raising awareness of the campaign. But every single person on this planet can make a difference. We can't rely on the governments to do it. We want people to lead this charge. And we start by uniting 1.2 billion persons with disabilities behind this campaign. Exactly. I'm sure uh, after this session, everybody will be on board and, uh, and register and share. Um, thank you so much, Craig, for your contribution. And let's go to Freddie Farhat from Para Football to share how uh, their work is uh, promoting and contributing to more disabled people's uh, representation and their work with diverse uh, football federations and associations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, Craig, um, wonderful presentation and that's a campaign that you've all been involved in and supported in any way possible or it's more big, so congrats to that. Uh, my name is Freddie. I'm 27 years old, a white male, black, black hair, black beard, Middle Eastern look. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and presenting about Para Football. Uh, Para Football was founded one year ago on December 3rd, the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and that was the time I joined uh, Para Football. And my main job at the company is just to develop the business side and just connect key stakeholders within the industry to support disability football and ensure equal opportunities to everyone. Um, if you go to the next slide. Yep, one more. Yep, so as I said, Para Football is a new foundation. It was founded one year ago. It's a nonprofit organization registered in the Netherlands at the Stitching Foundation. And we have three missions, three aims when, when we thought of para football. The first one is to bring together all the independent international federations. So in football, there's more than nine international federations that govern different types of disability football, and they never worked together before. Each one worked independently. And our mission was just to bring together all these international federations. And we're really proud that within less than 12 months, we were able to do that. Our second mission was to support all the national football associations and federations to be more inclusive, and develop para football opportunities through their countries or the region. And then just showcasing and spreading awareness about the opportunities available for all persons with disabilities in football. If you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Like, what is para football? And we had a nice uh, poll on LinkedIn where we asked people, like, what's the word that you relate to para football? Is it disability? Is it parallel? Is it Paralympic or is it other? like it was it was quite funny because some people were just trying to get the right answer and some like most of them said disability but in fact it's all three it's being parallel being equal it's being disabled it's being part of the paralympics it's part of football associations it's all together um so that was something nice to hear about um next slide please yep um so in less than a year like i said earlier we're really proud that nine international federations that have done different types of disability, whether it's CP football, blind football, amputee, wheelchair, skate soccer, a visual impairment, all of them, they're now part of the para football. They form the para football steering board. Like they are the beating heart of para football, working together just to ensure all the different types of football, disability football are, are represented and just working to recognize these federations and develop their football opportunities more and just aligning them with the right vision and mission of para football. On to the next slide, please. Yeah, along with just working together with international federations, um, we, the aim was just to bring in some role model football associations that are leading in disability football. Um, and like we wanted just to have like, approach all football associations like, across the world. But like at the moment, we have four role model FAs. Uh, the Royal Belgian Football Associations, they are really leading in disability and have different kinds of uh, football teams. Uh, across all kinds of disabilities, along with the Japan Inclusive Football Federation. They are an affiliate of the Japanese Football FA. Um, and just this week, the Football Association of England, the oldest football association in the world, just joined the Para Football Network that you can announce on Monday, uh, which gives us real honor that 
like a big FA or like England are just recognizing the importance of para football, uh, along with the Dutch FA as well. Like we hope that these four FAs would just set a benchmark, set an example to all the football teams across the world. And like the sky is the limit to us. We hope that within the coming years, all the football teams be part of this network and working together just to ensure equal opportunities for everyone. Uh, but along with football associations, if you can move to the next slide. Yep. So it's all also about connecting all key stakeholders, not only football associations. Uh, so moving on. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, when we did our audit in para football, we found that in each country, it's either the football association that's governing disability football. And some of them, it's the International Federation, and some it's a National Paralympic Committee, or sometimes an independent disability sports organization. So the key is just to link in all these key stakeholders, the Football Association, the International Federation, the National Paralympic Committee, or an independent organization, just to work together in a strategic way, coordinated way, to deliver the right approach in certain country, help them to get funds, how to identify players, how to promote well. Uh, and like we believe by working together, we're stronger. And that's one of our missions, just to connect all these key stakeholders. Next slide, please. Yeah, next one, please. Yeah. Uh, so what we created for Para Football is they all joined the network, but like we wanted to keep them engaged as well. So we created a LinkedIn forum when all the key stakeholders are there, just share insights, share messages. Same for, for, for the Facebook group, like a community group, as well as the workplace. They can share documents there, talk to each other, like share best practices. If there's a topic they need to cover, project they want to work on. So the, just the aim is just to stay connected and work together. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and recently, this is one of our uh, recent workshops and really interesting one uh, with the West Asian Football Federation. Um, so uh, the West Asian Football Federation approached para football where they wanted to do an audit to see each federation, how they can develop para football in their country. Um, we're really proud that 11 member associations participated in the, in the, in the event out of 12. So more than 90% took part. There were six online development workshops where 12 types of para football were promoted and covered. And there were many representatives from football associations, international federations, NGOs, and experts. But the, the, what, what was really interesting in this session is that it was the first time that the West Asian Football Federation and the West Asian Para Federation, they just met and worked together. And they've been in the same country, in the same city ever since their existence, but they never worked together. But just by doing this workshop and promoting disability football in the region, they just worked together. And what was interesting also that some federations, they had one or two types of disability, some of them none at all. But after the workshop, they all now working towards making sure there's all types of disability covered along with para football supporting them, just to make sure that football is for everyone in the region. Um, football is not developed well in these countries, but with the right attitude, the right work, and then by working together, they can achieve that. And like that basically covers uh, my presentation today. Um, if you can go, I think, to the next slide. Yeah, so that covers my presentation today. Um, and if you need anything, feel free to contact us at Para Football. And just my my key message today would be like I've said it throughout the presentation is like by working together, we are really, really stronger. By uniting and like connecting all key stakeholders, we can really ensure that there's equal opportunities for everyone to play the game they love. And thank you. Thank you, Freddie. What a, what a great uh, movement as well. Um, if I can ask you a quick question. So yeah. you, you have been really promoting para football across the world and facilitating and really building the, the structure and the ecosystem that needs to move forward. Um, since you had to communicate and support diverse uh, organizations across the world, what is the key? How did you adapt based on different um, countries, languages, cultures? Yeah. How can you bring this... Uh, organizations together and and transfer really know how and best practices yeah that's a that's a really nice question Ani. Uh, i think we were fortunate enough to have volunteers coming from all across the world so we had people from greece we had people from africa we had people from the middle east people from europe netherlands england people from us and i think having that diverse network that diverse volunteer group it made it easier for us to contact a key stakeholder within every region so we started by ourselves, you know, if I know someone in the Middle East, I'll contact them. If one other knows someone in Greece, they'll contact them. And like, we just 
that we brought all everyone together and that we hope to keep on doing this moving forward. Amazing. Thank you so much, Freddy. Um, and now we are going to move to Donald. Um, he's going to, to share with us a very, very interesting program. I, I can't wait to hear about it. Uh, Donald, can you tell us a little bit more about the program you developed? Of course, Football yeah. Memory? So let me introduce myself first. My name is Donald Murphy. I'm a 52-year-old white Irish male. Um, for a while, I had dark hair like Freddie's, but unfortunately, now it's beginning to turn grey. Um, but we're proud of that as well. So I work with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So we provide services and advocacy for people with dementia, uh, their families and their carers in, in Ireland. Uh, what I'm here to talk about today is about a concept that we have begun to introduce into Ireland, which is a program called Sporting Memories. So it really is a reminiscence program for people with dementia. With dementia, um, unfortunately, you know, it, it can transverse the world. Um, so it's in every corner of the world. So a big challenge with dementia, and I'll go back maybe to Craig's presentation as well, is the idea of what do people with dementia want? They want to be included. OK, they want to be able to do some of the things they did previously. So a lot of that is coming through sport. And that's why we're trying to tie both of these things up. Before I just talk about how we've, we've only just started to introduce it into Ireland, I'll just tell you what, what is the concept, because if you're not living with dementia or not, you know, dementia hasn't entered your life, this may be kind of alien to it. It is extremely simple. So any sporting club in the world, and this will be my message, will have people who were either members, still members, played with them or whatever, who unfortunately now have dementia. So I'll use Manchester United as an example. So what we would be saying to Manchester United is that they invite every club member that has dementia to an event. The event would have a topic. So, for example, their first monthly event, the topic could be Cristiano Ronaldo. OK, Cristiano would come along and it's very, very simple. OK, there may be a Q&A with Christian, Cristiano. There may be teas, coffees. There may be videos shown. There may be quizzes. There may be cards, etc. So it's kept very, very simple. The important thing, this is a social outlet for people with dementia and their families, so it should be driven around what they require over time. But usually there needs to be a topic behind it. So that's really what we're looking to introduce. We have now introduced it into Ireland. OK, we've used football. So it's football memories is the first we're bringing into Ireland and maybe interested in linking up with Freddie at some stage as well with other countries. But obviously my focus is the Republic of Ireland. So we initially brought it into a local uh, uh, amateur football club called Ashburn United. And we ran a number of programs there. And I had said that I would just give you a, a sense of what can come out of it. So I give an example of one of the programs we ran in there. It was a gentleman with dementia who came along to one of them. And the discussion, the topic was Scottish football. So we spoke about Scottish football. His wife had passed away and he was being cared for by his two teenage daughters. They knew he had been a footballer previously, but they believed he only played football in Ireland. They never knew he played football in Scotland. At this point, it would never come up because his wife had passed away. So as we discussed Scottish football, the memory came back to him of playing professional football in Scotland. And the two daughters cried. OK, so that's the magic of what can happen. We ran a number of programs then with that club, and then we uh, partnered now with the Football Association of Ireland, uh, the FAI. OK, so their goal is to launch this for all semi-professional clubs in Ireland. And the first one we've done it with is Shelburne Football Club, which are a semi-professional club in, um, in Dublin. So they have run approximately five or six of these. The pandemic hasn't been ideal because these, these programs have, to, have been run online which doesn't have the impact it does when you bring locally. So they've ran a number of them. The, the beautiful story I'm going to tell about the first one. There is a famous Irish goalkeeper called Packy Bonner, okay, who um, was extremely famous. He saved a couple of penalties in a World Cup. We won't go into that, I suppose. But anyway, uh, he spoke and we, whatever, but a person with dementia came on and said, for the first time in my life, I'm happy I have dementia because I've got a chance to meet my hero amazing so all the work these guys are doing sometimes we miss the little things that make a difference to a person's life 
So I just said I'd add those two stories in that are quite amazing. So Shelburne have run a number of these now. And now, thankfully, they're moving to the, running the programs in their own stadium now in Tolka Park, um, where people with dementia get a tour of the stadium. They come into one of the rooms. They'll bring in a famous um, uh, Shelburne football player. They will have a Q&A. They will watch videos of it. They may watch uh, the 1957 Cup Final, whatever it is that will create discussion and uh, a nice community experience. So a lot about this, about clubs, is to get the people with dementia and their kid back into the club. So that's a very big thing. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, so the plans are to, again, I, I would talk about vision like the guy said, but there's absolutely no reason why every sporting club, be it cricket, tennis, athletics, can't do this uh, in the country of Ireland. And my overall message then would be there's no reason why every club around the world, be it whatever sport, can't do this at least once a month to give back to people who've probably given an awful lot to those clubs. And it'll create a great community spirit and drive behind it. I hope that kind of gives you an idea. So what we're trying to do. Yes. Amazing program, Donald. And um, that comes to my question. Uh, in order to, to achieve this, um, yeah. what, what would you say to these sporting organizations in terms of trusting NGOs like yours for their expertise and, and yeah. access to community to actually create human-centered designed uh, programs and yeah. really so, create the impact? Yeah, so they, they should reach out initially, okay? to the relevant NGO or whoever is is managing the dementia service in that country. They should reach out to those initially, um, but they should then be trained up. But again, I suppose we need to understand and everyone needs to understand that just because a person has dementia, now they will get a period where this service will no longer be suitable as the, as the disease progresses. So it gets to a point where it isn't, but there is a certain period where and um, while there'll be a certain amount of training, it won't be massive. We are all human beings, okay? So the big thing that's important here is we treat everybody with respect. As I always say, and, and just everyone needs to understand that. So there's a little chat with all those clubs that say, that's all you need to understand. The carer or a loved one will be with them as well. So at the session, the role of fully caring for the person with dementia is still with their carer or whatever, okay? So it's not that it's like in a care center or whatever where there's carers in there. So it's not as challenging as it may seem to clubs, okay, at all. Um, and to be honest, they should be linking out to people with dementia anyway in whatever format. So all we're doing here is giving them the conduit to do that, okay? Yes, exactly. And um, my next question is, uh, having myself and my family a person affected uh, yes. by dementia, um, uh, I see the what was the, the big negative impact of uh, the pandemic to, to the development of the disease. Um, and as you said, it, it didn't really help in the further no. development of the program. Um, what can we do and how can we help you to, to move it forward? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a, there's a double barrel question there. Certainly the pandemic has been detrimental hugely to people with dementia. Uh, and their loved ones. So sometimes people forget that the pressure that's on the loved one or the carer, they usually have to give up their jobs, they have to care for a person, their life changes. So dementia does change your life. Like I think I said to one of you guys earlier on, sometimes, you know, having a child in your family change your life, having dementia will change your life as well. So the big issues with, and I'll touch on the program with, with the pandemic and uh, dementia has been the isolation. Okay, people haven't been able to get out to services. Okay. We have obviously been trying to put phone calls in. It's not the same. And the other huge thing is that the person caring for the person with dementia no longer gets a break now. So they're caring now 24-7 in their own home, which for anybody who has experienced dementia, that is an incredibly difficult thing to do. With regards to the program, um, again, I suppose we'll be driving it here within Ireland. The pandemic has slowed it up, but the FAI are hugely behind it. They have now produced uh, specific little cards of players so that we can use it, all that type of stuff. Shelburne are now moving towards um, towards uh, bringing it into their own ground. And now we're talking to some of the other clubs. But we're running, you know, we're running shop stuff like this with the different League of Ireland clubs. And it's proof of concept. So as we start to do these, you know, we expect this to expand and expand and expand. 
With regard to outside of Ireland, um, if there are any countries, organizations, any football organizations, if they want to get in touch with me or whatever, I, I'm not the main person running this. There's a different person. Her name is Jamie Sherlock. She's just not available today. Um, but we can certainly give them some pointers. But it's a huge program in Scotland, for example. So the Scottish FA um, are partnered with all their league clubs over there. So huge. There are a number of clubs in the Premiership as well who do this. And again, we can encourage people to look at videos. Um, say West Bromwich Albion, for example. I know they're on the Premiership at the moment. They're in, um, I think, the, the Championship. They, do, they have some wonderful videos of some of the sessions they run. And it just shows how simple it is to do it, okay? And it doesn't cost yeah. teas, coffees, etc., a room, okay? There is a bit of work in it. You don't just rock up and it appears. There's a little bit of work in it, but it, it's not a huge, a huge stretch work-wise, so. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donald, You're for welcome. your contribution. I think we should go now to some uh, questions from the audience. We have been receiving really interesting questions. And I'll start with the first one. So what can football learn from We The 15? I guess that's from, for Craig. <laughs> I think football can learn a lot. I think everyone can learn a lot from We The 15. I mean, I think my next step on We The 15 is, is how can we get football clubs around the world helping to amplify the campaign? I think that's step one. Step two is is something we do at the IPC when it comes to accessibility of, 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 the, ven of the venues for the Paralympic Games is many of the accessible seats at football stadia around the world are segregated from the rest of the crowd. How can we fix that? Because that's not inclusion. Um, so for me, I think I want to see how football clubs around the world can amplify the campaign. I mean, I look at the Premier League last week, they did rainbow laces and it was a great initiative with global, global coverage. Could they do something on disability where they, they, they show the film and, and such like, and why would that just be the Premier League? Why can't any sport league around the world, whether it's NFL, NBA, get behind this campaign and show their support? Because only then will we be truly putting disability at the heart of the inclusion agenda. So, so two simple things for me is support the campaign and build awareness. And the other one is, is maybe look at the venues and how we can be more inclusive when people with disabilities come to attend games. Exactly. Um, next question. Uh, how to avoid clubs um, and other uh, associations focusing purely on playing opportunities, but ensure they take holistic approaches to access um, and, and include uh, disabled people. So beyond just playing opportunities. Freddie, you want to take that or Craig or don't know? I'll let Freddie go first. Yeah. Can you say that again? I lost you there midway. Yes. Yeah, so basically, what can we do to, to uh, include disabled people beyond playing opportunities? So really as an audience, as, as yeah. participants, as employees. In, in the sporting ecosystem and football specifically. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's lots of organizations playing a key part in that, including CAFE and all the, the attendants today and audience. Uh, but I think the key message at the beginning is just to spread awareness, like like what the week 15 is doing, just spread awareness at the beginning, showing that we're all equal, we all can do the same, you know? If you just give us the opportunity, then there we are. I think football clubs and leagues, they all have like a duty to do that, whether it's, through organizing certain events, just being there in match days, circular workshops, all kinds of activations where just people can just go there and just show what they're able, able to do. I think that's, that's just be an opening. Yeah, I'd agree fully with that. I mean, it's about, and look, I suppose, how does this work? I think pressure, advertisements, keep going, keep going, keep going, because football clubs or any sporting clubs have corporate responsibilities. OK, so they should be looking to include every human being that's within their club or with the. So I guess organizations like yourselves and is to keep pushing, OK, to allow those opportunities to happen. But again, clubs should be doing this. OK, they may not be. And I guess then it's the only way to do it is keep pushing, keep pressing, keep advertising like the work Craig you've done, for example, and keep getting the message out there. It's challenging, but it's vitally important. Exactly. And uh, now that you mentioned, there is a question from the audience. Uh, great to see something that breaks the usual stereotypes of disabled people in the media. Uh, and this is for Craig. How important is it that media empowers disabled people like this and not as negatively as they usually do? 
I think it's hugely important. That's what We The 15, one of the main aims of We The 15 is to change the stigma attached to disability because for, for too long in the world, disability has been seen as a negative. Mm-hmm. And we really want to change that. And, it, and, and there's a great quote from one of our Paralympians who took pay, part in, um, in, 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 in Tokyo and it said, it shouldn't take an athlete to do a great sport in perform, an exceptional sport in performance to change the stigma attached to disability. The world needs to change generally. And I think it's really important that we that we all work together. And this is the joy of collaboration is we, by working together, our voice is amplified and we can really, really push. But we've got to, I think what we've tried to do with We The 15 is, is highlight to the world's media that, yeah, you are progressing the inclusion agenda, but you're forgetting disability. Don't forget it. And we're even like looking at organizations at the moment going, where are the persons with disabilities in your workforce? You've probably advanced in terms of, of, of gender and ethnicity, but where are the persons with disabilities in your workforce? And why are you not employing persons with disabilities? So one of the things we're going to be looking at doing with We The 15 next year is working with some employers on how they can even set up scholarships and such like to increase the number of persons with disabilities in key industries, because ultimately what we want here is a cultural switch. And to see that, we need to see persons with disabilities on TV and films and such like. And I always say on the film industry, we have the LA 2028 Paralympic Games coming up. That's a huge opportunity for us to really change Hollywood. And I think we'll look back in 20 years' time in horror at the discrimination that persons with disabilities currently face in the same way that we're looking back now on other other areas of inclusion and thinking, I can't believe we did that. And I think in 20 years' time, we'll look back on disability and go, we were so, so bad back then. Uh, we need to change it. So let's let's start that change now. Exactly. Uh, I'm right with you. And I believe uh, the Valuable 500 said that from the companies that actually include this uh, inclusion diversity in their agenda, only 4% includes disability. Um, and, and that's a very nice comment from the audience, um, which I totally agree with. Um, it's important that disabled people are involved in leadership roles in the NGOs you collaborate with to ensure that nothing about us without us. And, totally. and uh, yeah. Totally agree. I mean, our chief executive at the IPC, Mike Peters, he's a two-time Paralympian. He has cerebral palsy. Um, across the IPC, we have persons with disabilities at all levels of our business. And it's really important because <laughs> at the end of the day, I- I'm someone without a disability. I can't be the one leading the way if I'm not getting the right views from the community. So it's really important that that we build that. And our governing board, we have a board of 12 members. Um, Seven of them have disabilities. And that's really important when we lead the charge in change. Exactly. It's crucial. Uh, An amazing session today. Thank you so much for your contribution. I think the key message here today was let's collaborate, let's make it together, let's include the people we we design for and let them lead the way. Um, I'm looking forward to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you for coming here today. For the audience, we have uh, some great group discussions coming up. So go back to the lobby and make sure you join them. Thank you for having us today.